Welcome everyone to Mamados Medical Media, a free online YouTube channel, weekly posting new medical videos. Join our Facebook and Telegram groups for more interaction and latest news. You could also support the channel on Patreon, where we upload multiple choice questions and other premium content. Thanks in advance. Hi everyone. In the previous three videos, we covered the functions of the receptors and the two most important sensory tracts. In this video, we take a look at the cerebral cortex. Starting this video with the function or a role that the sensory cortex do all the time, and it's called the coding of sensory information. So coding of sensory information is done for the purpose of raising awareness about an internal or external stimuli. Coding is possible even though all signals coming to the cortex comes in a form of action potential. The process of coding enables the sensory cortex to discriminate between the modality or type of sensation, locality or site, strength of the stimulation or intensity of the stimulation. Now let's look at the reasons to how the sensory cortex become able to identify the type of sensation or the modality of sensation. First reason is that for every receptor there is a specific or adequate stimulus that the receptor is most sensitive to. Second reason is that regardless the method of stimulation, a receptor or its pathway, when stimulated, they will give rise to one type of sensation. This is called the law of specific nerve energies. There is a specific pathway or tract for every sensory modality. So for example, we have touch pathway or pain pathway, etc. Fourth and last reason being that there is a specific area in the sensory cortex for every type of sensation at any part of the body. The sensory cortex could also discriminate or identify the site of stimulation and this is what's called locality and it means that the conscious perception of a particular sensation is projected or showed in the brain according to the site of the stimulated receptors irrespective to where the stimulation was along the pathway. This is called the law of projection and this law explains a scary interesting phenomenon called the phantom or the ghost limb which happens days after surgical amputation of a limb so for example in the lower limb amputation below the knee surgeons stitch and leaves an area of the leg so that patient could use prosthetic leg this area they call the stump so when nurses come clean the wound two to three days after surgery so during dressing they stimulate some nerve pathways and the patient develops a feeling of numbness pain or even touch sensation in areas like the ankle the big toe even though this part lost two days ago in the surgery this happens because the sensory cortex still projects areas that had been amputated but through a process that we will talk about later on this video called the neuroplasticity everything turns back to normal so phantom limb is a false interpretation from the sensory cortex that doesn't last long and get fixed in no time intensity or strength is discriminated by the sensory cortex through the frequency of action potentials the more the receptor is getting stimulated the more action potential frequency will be produced by the receptors. And this will be coded by the brain as a high intensity stimulation. Second factor affecting the intensity is the number of receptors. The more the number of stimulated receptors, the higher the intensity of the stimulation. So this is how your sensory cortex reads information. So, so far in this video we've been using the term sensory cortex a lot. So where we could find the somatosensory cortex and what is the somatosensory cortex? In the parietal lobe behind the central sulcus, a gyri called post-central gyrus. We find S1 or the primary sensory cortex. And it's the area that receives all types of sensations for every part of the body, except for some sensations received by other parts in the cerebral cortex. Along the line of the lateral sulcus, we find S2 or the secondary sensory area. It has projection for specific parts of the body. 
Then we have the remaining area of the parietal lobe. It's called the sensory association area. And it's an area that receives fibers from the primary sensory area and the secondary sensory area. It's not just a sensory area, it's an area of interpretation. In this area, perceptions of proprioception and stereognosis is perceived. And in this area, interpretation of some higher functions happens all the time. Now we want to look at how the body is projected by the primary sensory area S1. The body is projected in an upside down projection. If we make a cut through the parietal lobe and look at a coronal section to the primary sensory area, we find that this would be the sensory cortex. It receives fibers coming from the contralateral or the other side of the body. Whether fibers coming through the dorsal column tract in which it crosses sides at the level of the medulla or the spinothalamic tract where it crosses sides or the cassate at the level of the spinal cord. The body is represented or projected in the sensory cortex as follows. Lower lateral area for the intra-abdominal, pharyngeal and tongue sensation and as we go upward we find larger area for the lips and face then an area for the gum and teeth a large area for the thumb hands and arms a small area is projected by the sensory cortex for the trunk area for the legs the foot and within the lower medial part of the parietal lobe an area for the genitalia the body is projected in the sensory area according to the number of receptors and how much work that part of the body do. So a homunculus is a drawing of a human-like creature. It was drawn in its size of parts with respect to the sensory area projection of that part of the body. So in the homunculus, you see the hands are large, lips and lower jaw are largely presented also. On the other hand, the trunk and legs, in spite of their size, they are small in the homunculus. In addition to coding of sensory information, the sensory cortex is able to further discriminate between the site of stimulation and it's called the spatial recognition. And not only it discriminates the site, but the sensory cortex is able to discriminate between two points of stimulation applied simultaneously, and this is called the two-point discrimination. In the hand, only two millimeters space between two stimuli are needed to discriminate between two points. But in the trunk, we need 30 millimeters space between two points to discriminate between them. Strength or intensity was previously discussed in this video. Stereognosis is the ability to describe an object by handling while eyes are closed. And we talked about it in the video of the dorsal column track. Other CNS parts that interpret sensory informations are within the medulla, we have the nucleus of tractus solitarius, which interpretates most of visceral sensations and perceive sensation of taste. The thalamus acting like a gateway for all sensations except olfaction. Not only that, it was proven that the thalamus can perceive some sensations of pain and temperature. Now before ending up with this video, we want to take a look at a process called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity happens after the death or disuse of some areas of the sensory cortex or other areas in the cerebral cortex. For example, here if we suppose that the thumb was amputated, after weeks sensory areas of the other fingers will expand and invade the dead or the non-used area. This expansion could be neuronal or axonal according to the site of the lost area in the cerebral cortex. Another example that is when someone loses vision and the visual area is dead, the auditory and the association sensory areas will expand and invade the dead area, resulting in a better hearing quality and deeper perception of sensations on higher functions. So neuroplasticity means with every part you lose, God forbid, you gain a stronger sensation of the other parts. So you lose some and you win some. And so guys, that's it uh, for this video and we meet in our next video.